So, ladies and gentlemen, um, it's a great pleasure to welcome you all here this evening. I'm Ron Zimmern, and I'm the chairman of the um, PhD Foundation, and I have the honor and privilege to be your host for this evening. So for those who don't know me, I'm a public health physician by training, and I've been involved in genomics and health policy for many years. And it was I who established the predecessor to this organization, the Public Health Genetics Unit, in 1997. <coughs> so it gives me great pleasure to welcome our two conversationalists, not um, uh, lecturers, conversationalists, Dame Professor Sally Davis and Professor Eric Meslin. And it's not normal for me to go in for formal introductions. I, I'm usually pretty informal. But on this occasion, I will do so. Because what they have done and where they have come from will provide the context for what they have to say and for their observations and their opinions. So as many of you will know, Sally was installed as the 40th Master of Trinity College on the 8th of October last year after a stellar career as a clinical academic and public servant. She graduated from Manchester Medical School in 1972 and started her clinical career as a hematologist specializing in sickle cell disease. Her work in the hemoglobinopathies resulted in her appointment as honorary professor at Imperial College in 1997. And it was soon after that that I first met her. She had by then started her foray into health policy and administration and took up the post of Regional Director of Research and Development at, I think it was the Northwest Thames Regional Health Authority. This was about the same time that I established the, North, uh, the Public Health Genetics Unit. And we used to meet at various gene genetic policy meetings, and there weren't many of them, but were held at that time. As I continued to develop our unit, Sally went on to higher things, taking on the post of Scientific Advisor to the Department of Health in 2004, she founded the National Institute of Health Research in 2006 and acted as its inaugural director. She was appointed chief medical officer for England in 2011 and left that post last year to take up the mastership of Trinity. Over that period, she has drawn attention to and has intervened in a number of important health issues through her chief medical officer reports. The one that was for me most relevant to our work at the PhD Foundation focused on genomics and provided a comprehensive look at the subject from a public health perspective. And I'm pleased to say that many of the contributors to that report were from Cambridge. While continuing to champion the cause of genomics through the establishment of Genomics England, her professional energy was directed at another important health issue, antimicrobial resistance a subject that she has made very much her own. As a member of the WHO Executive Board from 2014 to 16, and in her capacity as the UN Interagency Coordinating Group on Antimicrobial Resistance, she has of anyone in the world, and I use that phrase in a very literal sense, of anyone in the world she has championed its cause. She will be continuing this work as the UK's government special advisor on antimicrobial resistance while being master of Trinity. Sally was made Dame of the British Empire in 2009, and in the recent New Year's honors, she was honored with an even higher um, uh, accolade, the Dame Grand Cross of the Order of the Bath for services to public health and research. I now turn to Eric Meslin, our visitor from Canada. <laughs> Eric is President and Chief Executive Officer of the Council of Canadian Academies, joining it in 2016 after many years in academia and various government jobs. He is a philosopher by training, gaining his first degree at York University in Canada and then took a master's at Georgetown University in the United States. In the 15 years prior to his present job, he was the founding director of the Indiana University Center for Bioethics and an associate dean at its School of Medicine. His interests range across the spectrum of bioethics and he has published extensively in areas as diverse as genomics, international health, big data and human subjects research. 
Eric is not unknown in Europe either. He has had academic positions at the University of Oxford when uh, it was at the time when David Sackett was just starting to introduce EBM, evidence-based medicine, to the UK. And more recently, he was a visiting fellow for a year in Toulouse at Anne Cambon Thompson's department, for which he was appointed Chevalier de l'Ordre National du, du Mérite by the French government. Eric was appointed vice chair of the UK Biobank's Ethics and Governance Council in 2016. He has been a member of numerous advisory committees to the WHO, to UNESCO, the Canadian Institute of Health Research, the Institute of Medicine, CDC in Atlanta, and Genome Canada. He was also intimately involved in human genome sequencing, having been appointed as the ethicist for the Human Genome Project after Eric Jungst stood down, and has had the distinction of being the executive director of the National Bioethics Advisory Committee appointed by President Clinton. I have been privileged to know and to work with Eric over this last 10 years or so, and it is a very great pleasure to welcome him to Cambridge. So if I may, the form of the evening will be a conversation between our two distinguished visitors. They will converse from their seats. No lectern, no slides. So I've asked them each to give a 10-minute introduction. This will be followed by some moderated conversation about a variety of topics. And then at around 6.30, we shall throw the session open to the audience for questions and comments. We finish at 7 o'clock sharp, for there will be drinks outside and the opportunity to mingle. So perhaps we might start with our visitor, Eric Neslund. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, after those very generous uh, biographical intros, we could probably open it up for questions and say, <laughs> so what was that like? <laughs> or can't you hold a job, or... <laughs> and in a, a kind of ironic way that the, uh, um, the very generous introduction that, uh, Ron, you gave, I think, both of us, speaks in some way to the, the topic of the evening, which is how does one even imagine the idea of having some form of impact or influence on what must seem to be uh, the most complicated uh, set of topics one can imagine from uh, genomics to uh, medical research, uh, pathogens and the like, uh, in a world where governments uh, work in very strange and mysterious ways. I only have 10 minutes, so I will not reflect on what the heck happened in Iowa last night for those who are tracking this and how likely that will be to predict uh, the re-election of Donald Trump. Uh, but I want to use a couple of examples to make three very simple uh, points. Uh, and I'll use the examples from my current position. I could give you examples from any of the rest of uh, my biography, and I'm sure Sally could do the same thing three times over. Uh, the CCA, uh, as Ron mentioned, is a, an organization that really uh, is probably Canada's equivalent of the National Academies in the US. Uh, we have our own Royal Society of Canada, so it functions in the same way as the Royal Society here. And it is regularly asked by the government uh, to provide evidence to help inform their policy deliberations. We've completed 50 of them over the last 15 years. I've been in post for just four years. So I want to reflect in, uh, in my time on three very different assessments to make three very different, but I hope complementary, points about how impact and evidence uh, all fits together. Uh, one of the assessments we carried out and completed a couple of years ago was on medical assistance in dying, a massive topic, familiar to all of you, um, and one that uh, was instructive for me, not because of its bioethical implications, but rather because of the way it came to us and what we did with the request uh, for, uh, for information. Canada decriminalized aid in dying in 2016 in a piece of legislation, Bill C-14, that included three topics that the Canadian Parliament was 
literally scared to death, no pun intended, uh, to address. One of them was whether aid in dying would be something that mature minors could avail themselves uh, of. A second was what about people who have a mental disorder as the sole underlying condition? And the third was could one put down in one's advanced directive that in the event of one's incapacity, I would then wish uh, to have aid in dying. Section 9.1 of Bill C-14, I remember it as if it were yesterday, included a request that there be an assessment of the evidence on this topic, tabled in Parliament no more than two years after royal assent of that bill. I received a phone call from the then Ministers of Health and Justice asking whether the CCA would carry out that assessment. My answer was yes, we would, because that's our job. And then we proceeded to delve into what was a very thin layer of evidence on this topic. No one has been carrying out uh, aid in dying for those three categories anywhere in the world for any amount of time. A little bit's been done in, in uh, Belgium, a little bit in the Netherlands, but there were no longitudinal studies of uh, benefits and harms, none of, the, none of the, the like. We completed the work on time, on budget. The Attorney General tabled it in the House of Commons on December the 13th, 2018, as requested. I think the government asked us to do this for two reasons. One was they wrote a bill that said there had to be an assessment. And sometimes governments ask for things, not because they want the information, but that it helps them fulfill other pragmatic policy purposes. We're working on this subject. We've appointed an expert panel to look at it. So get off our back. We'll, we'll come back to you when we're, when we're ready. Sometimes they actually want the information. Sometimes they want the information because it's interesting. Sometimes they want it because they might need it. Sometimes they want it because they want to hoard it for later use, for an appropriate time when they can deploy it. It turns out that time I thought would be three, four, five years after our report, but it was only about 18 months. Canada elected a minority government a few months ago, and the new Attorney General, looking at that legislation, said, we need to update Canada's aid and dying law. I know we happen to have three assessments from the Council of Canadian Academies. We'll use those in addition to two very famous court cases that had been challenging Canada. So in a way, if you ask me what kind of impact can evidence have, I can say two things. One is when you're asked at the right time for it and you provide it in a way that is non-controversial, we made no recommendations. We said, this is what is known about this topic. We didn't say the government is foolish for not doing this. They should hold their cards to themselves. They should extend made to children. They shouldn't. No statement of advocacy in that document. Very useful uh, mechanism. The message that I take from our MAID experience is that you can have impact when you just stick to the facts. You can have impact when you stick to the facts. The second is we never know when that impact will occur. It may happen a week, a month. It may not happen for 5, 10, or 15 years. So you have to be rather uh, patient. My second example, uh, a different assessment. This is very <laughs> dramatic. Yeah. Yeah. Shall I wait till, does that mean I, I'm done? Carry <laughs> on. You know, it's funny, Bill Clinton in the second State of the Union, uh, they loaded the wrong speech into his teleprompter. <laughs> and he gave the first 12 minutes of that speech cold, no problem, till they found the right VHS tape, advanced it to where he was, and he kept going. So this is nothing. I can give my, <laughs> I can give my second example without any difficulty. Second example is on the topic I know near and dear to, uh, or should be, to everyone in the room, and that's climate change. We were asked to undertake an assessment just last year 
on the subject of climate change, but not its broadest uh, uh, manifestation, but rather a very specific type of question. And the question we were asked was not, as we were with MADE, what's the state of knowledge on this topic, but rather, what are the socioeconomic uh, risks associated with it? In fact, not just socioeconomic risks, what are the actual priority topics in climate change adaptation that will lend themselves to government action? Now think about this. The question, as I think you would all appreciate, matters probably more than anything else in policy advice. Generic questions are fascinating. Specific questions are, could be quite frustrating for those who are asking them. Be careful what the answer might be. It might be yes or no, or it might be positive or negative. But co uh, coining the right question is incredibly valuable. Now, I mention this because we were asked this question, what are the top priority uh, risks amenable to adaptation? not by the Minister of Environment and Climate Change, as you might expect for a topic on climate change. Remember, MADE was requested of us by the Minister of Health and the Minister of Justice. That seems to make sense. Who asked us to carry out an assessment on adaptation? The Treasury Board Secretariat, one of the central agencies of the government. The ones who, as one might say, whoever has the gold makes the rules. That's the real golden rule in politics. Well, the Treasury Board and the Department of Finance have the gold. And when they ask the question, what are the top climate risks amenable to adaptation, they are asking not because they care about climate change. I say that slightly um, uh, sort of cynically. But they realize that the way to have impact is to frame this in a way that hits the pocketbook. They want to know how to make decisions. The thing about that report, which was also completed on time and sent in as requested, was that it made a second kind of, uh, I, would, I would make a second kind of observation about it with respect to impact. Changing this from an environmental issue to a treasury board or finance issue did two things. One is it de-siloed the topic around the cabinet table. It was no longer, they're talking about climate, wake me up when we're talking about something that is interest to my ministry. This becomes important for the entire cabinet. So it was a socialization process. The second thing that was important was that Canada, by asking us to carry out that, uh, that topic, had intentionally moved the goalposts from mediation to adaptation. It was a policy statement about where we are on the climate file. We know that it's here. The evidence is obvious. We're not debating the evidence about climate change. We know we have to deal with this. Now how will we attend to it? I found that probably amongst the, the most uh, gratifying of our experiences, that this was a government that recognized that evidence was not determining their policy. This was not evidence-based policy. It was barely evidence-informed policy. They already had the evidence. Now they're trying to make a policy decision about how to deploy resources. I'll give you my third example, but it will be the briefest, and we've already discussed in advance. It's meant to be a segue uh, for Dame Sally. And that was, we too have been asked to undertake uh, a, an evaluation of antimicrobial resistance. Um, who isn't looking at antimicrobial resistance these days? Well, it turns out a lot of people aren't, um, and that's a shame. More should be, because everyone's gonna die and it's gonna cost a lot of money, is sort of the, you know, the scare quote above the fold. We were asked to undertake uh, an evaluation of this topic by our Minister of Science. <coughs> Now, Canada's uh, cabinet is not dissimilar to the cabinet here. Lots of different files, lots of different people. When that uh, topic first came to the CCA five years ago, it really was more of a made-like topic. It was going to be a question, what's the state of knowledge about AMR? What do we know about this thing? What do the letters mean? 
and what does it mean for, uh, for the world. That topic never made it to my desk. It was sort of filed away for a period of time until the timing was right. And the question did change. I misspoke a little earlier. I didn't want to confuse you about climate. It changed from what's the state of knowledge about AMR to what truly is the socioeconomic impact on Canadians. Like the climate change topic, it de-siloed AMR from a health or science topic to an economic uh, topic. I hate to say that economics drives policy, but in the real world, it actually does matter how many people are affected <coughs> Uh, by, this particular, uh, uh, by this particular problem. So I give a lot of credit to our former Minister of Science, Kirsty Duncan, who kept her tinder dry for about four years before the question was framed in a way, I would almost call it the policy equivalent of personalized medicine. This was the right question at the right time, framed in the right way, with the right purpose. We produced a report which literally scared the living daylights out of government and everyone else. Um, a number of people are going to die. It's not whether, it's how many. We learned this because we know that 26% of the population is resistant to first line antibiotics. We modeled that all the way up through 40%, all the way up to 100%. The GDP, the equivalent of New Brunswick, will be uh, um, affected. And what was nice about this, and here comes the segue, is not only did we simply hand in our homework, congratulate ourselves, and produce a number of nice documents, we became quite interested in how one mobilizes that knowledge and information. If you keep it uh, sitting on your desk or someone else's de desk, it's of no value. So we convened a meeting with some colleagues at McMaster University in Hamilton, Ontario, um, which has a major uh, um, institute, uh, co-sponsored by Canada's Gairdner Foundation. The keynote speaker at the event was Dame Sally, um, and we released that report uh, to the public. Um, I can say more about it later, but those are my three little examples, and I think it's probably easiest maybe to pass it over to away. Sally at this point. Thank you. And what I said at that meeting was, it's a rollicking good read. <laughs> and it is. So I've been in health policy in a very different way. Um, initially in research and development for the NHS, but sat first in the regional health authority, then in the department, and then later as chief medical officer. Um, so in the system, but not of the system. I came up as a consultant hematologist specializing in, in sickle cell disease and both doing R&D and as chief medical officer I had a degree <coughs> of independence that grew because I was first chief scientific advisor when I was doing R&D and then the chief medical officer is an independent post appointed by the cabinet secretary. Um, I was not the minister's choice. His choice didn't make it, make it. Um, <laughs> he got used to it. <laughs> but that meant I sat in the system. And I care about science, and I started my journey believing in not only evidence-based medicine, but evidence-based policy. I mean, I absolutely endorse everything that Eric said. I've ended up with, can we have evidence-informed policy? Um, that at least helps. And I got into antimicrobial resistance, which I would explain as drug-resistant infections, because I was doing one of my, my first, actually, annual report as chief medical officer on the state of the nation's health. And I actually wanted to do it differently. I, brought, I wanted not to write a monograph, which if someone was expert, they could pull apart. I would pulled apart a number of my predecessors' uh, efforts. I wanted the clinical academics and the academics to lay out the evidence on a subject I thought mattered and then help me think through what were the policy implications and I would then write that and make something happen. And actually, uh, when we look back, my reports have had a very big impact across a number of areas. But I thought infection was safe. It took me from community to hospitals to specialist care and 
hey, you know, there wasn't much new to say, and I could practice my craft. So I was a little taken aback when all the experts came together and they told me what their chapters said. I had read them, but they, they kind of talked about it and what that meant. And I said, but you're telling me that antimicrobial resistance, this was 2013, since I stopped seeing patients in 2006, has got worse. Yeah, yeah, quite a lot worse. Hmm. So what are we doing about it? Well, we've got an empty antibiotic pipeline, um, which I have already clocked, actually. And we keep telling people, but they don't take any notice. And this was the experts. And by the time we'd finished the day together, I said, OK, I didn't set out to do this, but I am going to give this issue voice. So there may be well be people in this audience who know technically much more than I do. I couldn't do what I do without the scientists and the technical people. But I set out to give it voice. I was helped by an alumnus of Trinity, as it happened, who was our minister without portfolio, who watched the presentation of my report and made me go in front of him with some uh, civil servants. And he said to the civil servants, so is it as bad as she says? And they said, yes. And he said, and aren't government about to produce a new AMR, antimicrobial resistance strategy? Yes. Sally, have you seen it? Yes. Does the, the report and, and the strategy answer your report? And I said, no, it's wet. <laughs> I was waiting to be stabbed in the back by those poor civil servants because he sent them away and gave them two months to come back with a strategy that I could sign off. And then said to me, what else should we do? So I undertook to think about it. And when I thought about it, the problem was, in the hospitals, they knew that if you get drug resistance, it doubles the length of stay, it doubles the mortality, it doubles the cost. They knew it was important, and we also know a lot about MRSA, but somehow we hadn't raised it higher. So I looked at climate change and thought, this is as complex as climate change. Actually, I now realize it really is. The more I've learned, the more complex I discover it is. So let's approach it like that. So I went out for dinner with the cabinet secretary, and I said, I want a stern review, an economic review of the impact of AMR on the world. And I want someone who's a world-known name in, um, in economics to do it, though they won't know what it is, and we'll have to do it for them. And I want them to sell it around the world. So he said, right, um, tomorrow morning I want on my desk a one-sheeter of what, what it is, and then you can come and see the Prime Minister. <coughs> so I went home, and after that half bottle of wine sat right <laughs> I hadn't done the uh, CMO guidelines on alcohol by then. Um, and um, sent it off. A week later I was in front of the Prime Minister, supposedly for 20 minutes, but I knew I was going to get a good listening. Cabinet Secretary came in. Not only did his private secretary in charge of health, but then his policy wonk and various other people. And I thought as I watched them lining up behind him, I got their attention. And 40 minutes later, I walked out having given a tutorial about bacteria and resistance development and about what I wanted. And we'd agreed he would sign off the name and we would do it. Um, so we had some effort in finding the right person and fishing that person in. I've written a book on it, so I gave it to the person. And we ended up with Jim O'Neill, who had been the chief economist at Goldman Sachs, who coined the word um, bricks and mints. He's very well known. It was great going to Brazil with him because they worship him. And then we, we, with the Wellcome Trust, set up a committee to advise and a big, quite a big team to deliver this, and it did the trick. We took it to the World Health Organization and it really, uh, and the UN and various things. But while he was doing that, it was clear we weren't getting enough traction. So I've been learning my. Um, my kind of craft of getting evidence into policy and how to get action as I go. So I thought the next thing would be we needed a resolution at the WHO. Um, 
And we got that within a year. I was told it would take five years because I persuaded DFID, our aid agency, to help. And they give most, a lot of money to WHO. So when they come in and say to WHO, we care about this, then you begin to get some action. But as one of my snotty colleagues said, yeah, it's fine having a resolution. When did that ever make a difference? And I thought, interesting, he's right. So we then wrote a global action plan. And just before we took it to WHO to sign off, you know, 175 countries, 192, whatever it is, someone said, but you're saying it matters in animals and fish and plants and oceans. So how do you make this work? So we got our ambassador to the Food and Agriculture Organization to take it through there, and we got our chief vet to take it through the Organization for Animal Health as well. I have to say, we, by then, had got a massive campaign. I'd gone back to see the cabinet secretary and said, how do I mobilize globally? And he said, you go and see the foreign office. Go and see the perm sec, permanent secretary. So I went to see the permanent secretary and said, I need your help. This is a problem. And he said, so what help do you want? And I said, yours. That's what the cabinet secretary says. You're going to help me. <laughs> and I sat there in silence. And I'm quite good at silence. And it was a long silence. It felt it anyway. And then she said, you need a campaign. And I said, bring it on. What's that? So what we actually had was, and you've seen it, our foreign office working for me. We had our ambassadors everywhere, but particularly in Geneva with the WHO, Rome with the FAO, Paris with the OIE, um, UN, New York, all working on this. And they loved it because it matters. It wasn't some political stupidity. No, I didn't say that. It wasn't some whim. It mattered. And that, actually, I think is also quite important, that you can really get the civil service, can really make a big difference if they choose to. Um, and, you know, there I was urging them on. But actually, they just made things happen. And eventually, in 2016, we had Jim, we had me, we had lots of ministers, because, of course, if you want something to happen, you give it to the ministers and give them the credit. At the UN, having a big meeting about it, which set off a whole strand more work. So it's how do you use diplomacy? How do you bring the whole thing together across government? How do you get people to move? And it is about relationships and trust and shared agendas. And it's the people skills as well as the evidence. And the advantage, of course, for me was I was sat in the middle of it. You can't have a conversation with without me saying, and what are you going to do for AMR? I was in the Department of Health yesterday, because I'm there, the special envoy. Um, and someone had said something, and I said, yes, but think about the AMR implications. They just can't escape it. <laughs> it's, when I was a kid, it was called Sally's water on a stone technique. <laughs> you just can't take no for an answer. And we've done lots of other things in similar ways. We've done a lot on genomics, setting up the 100,000 genomes. You can do a terrific amount if you choose to do it, and the evidence base is there. But it does need a lot of energy to push it, and um, you have to build collaborations and give it away and give the credit to lots of people. Um, and we could give you loads of stories between us. So I'd like, do? Yeah, but I'd like you to, to continue this. And the theme that I want you to develop is that one of evidence versus all these other soft things. <laughs> We're dealing with what I was taught years ago in management uh, as wicked problems. They're not tame problems. So really, how important is evidence? You know, we've got academics out there. So what do you tell to these young academics and things who think that evidence is the most important thing since sliced bread when you're developing policy. I mean, how do you carry on with this theme? It's come out of so the I'll, I'll, way, way, way. Uh, I'll drop a, uh, a pebble in the, in the pond that you can dribble on. Drip. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, the, uh, it's almost a non-starter question because without too much um, <clears throat> fussing around, this quickly becomes a, a debate about what, you know, what is evidence? 
Like what, what are we really talking about? Any, are we talking about um, randomized clinical trial data, that kind of evidence? Um, I can give you another example. The MADE study that I've mentioned, I'm only using it because it was a 43-member panel, the largest in our history. It took two years. It produced 850 pages of text, uh, and it cost a couple of million dollars to do. It was a really big deal. It was chaired by a former Supreme Court judge of Canada, Marie Deschamps, who is a lawyer by training. And uh, my mother's a lawyer, so this is not a criticism of lawyers. <laughs> but her um, intuitive, almost knee-jerk reaction to the concept of evidence is that which would be admitted into a court of law. That's what evidence means when you use that term. Have that conversation with clinical epidemiologists and you're not even speaking the same language. Have that conversation with philosophers who are interested in epistemology and you'll have a different conversation. And what I think we have learned, or I have learned, is that there really is a kind of epistemic hierarchy that exists that must be titrated for the right purpose. For some, I'll say politicians, and that's not a critical term, what they are looking for is a bloody good anecdote. That will move mountains. My brother's mother died of that infection. Now I see it's a problem. When I was working in the, in the Clinton administration, it was well known that every year, 20,000 children sponsored by the Juvenile Diabetes Research Foundation descended upon Capitol Hill and knocked on every single door of every member of the House and Senate. Here's Johnny. He has diabetes. You're sitting on the Appropriations Committee for the NIH. You could fund more diabetes research. This is Johnny. There were no data about um, insulin, about the pancreas, about the pharmacokinetics, about what new drug, it was, this is Johnny. Now that's one, is that evidence? You can go all the way up that epistemic tree to clear, compelling, peer review quality, you can go even further and go to truth if you would like to go to the very top of the tree. But I think the key message is learning that all evidence is not the same. It doesn't come in the same package. It's used in different ways for different purposes. And what's absolutely fascinating is that you have some semi-enlightened politicians who think that what they want is evidence because that's what all the cool kids say they want. We're an evidence, but in the first budget, don't get me, I know I'm finishing my comment. In the first budget of uh, Prime Minister Trudeau, uh, in 2016, evidence-based policy, the phrase, was used 16 times. Now that's a, that's a good thing. His predecessor, Stephen Harper's budgets, didn't include the phrases evidence-based policy. Now I'm not saying one is better than the other, but if you're in the evidence business, it's nice to see the word that you're working on, or it informs your organization's raison d'etre to see it in a federal budget. But that's not the same thing as evidence in a clinical trial, evidence in a court. They're learning the words and are trying to deploy them. So we have to, I like your idea of letting it be their idea. We have to let them figure out what it is they need and give them what they want. I think there's a Rolling Stones line that uh, comes out here, but I'll stop there. So it's quite interesting. When I became CMO, I thought about my predecessors, I think I was the 16th, but I've forgotten now, as I'm the 40th at uh, Trinity. And I was the first woman, and it was clear that there were eyes on me. And I, I had looked at my predecessors and thought, what were their strengths and what were their weaknesses? And I said to the politicians, I, my USP is going to be evidence and delivery. And I stuck to it. I, my reports were evidence-based, and my advice was evidence-based to a pretty high level, RCTs and as, as high. But then when I discussed with them, I'd say, look, we've got hard evidence on that, and we haven't got such hard evidence here. But then you get into judgment, and I think 
that where this evidence is pointing is there, I think that you would be well advised to go in that direction. So I was applying judgment, but because um, I had done so many things over my career that had worked and so many, taken so many decisions that they were well aware, looked risky at the time, but worked. They then trusted me, so then they did them and they did work because, you know, generally, if you're strong enough, they do work. So, you know, you, you start to use... <laughs> so this is, is this okay to do the back? Yeah. So this is why this is so imp important and gets into this um, sort of charming thing. You ask about the, the uh, uh, policy influencers of the future. Like, how do you do it? What's the magic? What's the secret? And the answer is there isn't any secret. Every case is a new, is a new case. But there is one thing that is, um, I think, consistent throughout, and we've been learning it at, at, at our shop. Um, Ron read my, my CV, and if you were to really do a qualitative analysis of it, you would see that for the vast majority of my career, I've been in the advice giving business, right? I worked for a, bioethic, a bioethics advisory commission. We advised the White House, which means we think you should do this or you should not do that, giving politicians the option to accept your advice or reject your advice. And I can give you lots of stories um, about what it's like to offer your advice and have it be rejected and not to take it personally. Or in the best case, uh, we had a report written for Bill Clinton and he rejected it before we submitted it. That was <laughs> unbelievable. Um, but the idea of assuming that all advice follows with a normative recommendation, I think you should be um, suspicious of. Sometimes the best advice is what Sally just said, this is what the evidence suggests. Even this is what seems to work everywhere in the world. I'm not saying you should do it. I'm not saying you should invest in it. I'm not saying that should be your policy. But you're saying almost that directly. Sometimes you don't have to push the final button. It's let them come to uh, the conclusion. That gives them space to appear to be considering all factions because quite honestly, Evidence is not the most important uh, factor in most policy decisions, unless you have a very broad definition. Sometimes it's a piece. Thank you for the report. Now we know what the state of knowledge is. Now I can feel more comfortable when I'm introducing a resolution or a bill. So it's, it's a very so I'm going to push you, push you further, because we've got a very, very, we've got a very distinguished um, person in this university, <coughs> David Spiegelhalter whose raison d'etre in his um, position as chair of the um, Professor of Public Understanding of Science is that it is my role to put the evidence as clearly as I can for you and to try not to bias it one way or the other. But then we've got marketing people. We've got one in the audience here. And we've got other people who want to push a particular thing. So what is in policy this? You know, who's right? Because when I played this back to David King in the context of climate change, he just said, I disagree with climate change. We have not got the luxury of producing neutral evidence. We have got to push a line. So this pushing a line and producing neutral evidence. You to go outside? <laughs> well, I was going to pick up, and it yeah. does get into that, what it's like to be on the inside when all these reports right. come in. And I think you have done a very good job. But we would get reports coming in um, from agencies, independent people, um, all sorts of places. And the ministers would say, what do you think? And I, I mean, I all too often would have to say, well, actually, you know, they've got 101 recommendations. They haven't prioritized them. But I personally would pick out those three as being worthy of consideration. I think people don't recognize what it's like to be the politician and on the inside where you're bombarded from everywhere with requests with, this is the evidence, you must do this. And actually, my role was as an advisor, mm -hmm. as well as producing the evidence, and therefore to moderate it. So clearly, 
Um, but then, when do you shift from being a straight advisor to advocacy? Yeah, and question. David King was an advocate on climate change. I am a campaigner on um, antimicrobial resistance. Actually, I think we both do use the evidence. I mean, um, David was my boss when I was chief scientific advisor. But we have been, um, um, but I try very hard to, to not only campaign, but to be pragmatic with them and talk to them about the strengths and weaknesses of cases and what can be done, but also to show them how, if they take action, it will reflect well on them and their parties. So I bring other issues into it. So uh, two, two, two quick things. One is there's a, a sort of form of, of policy politeness that I think sometimes people forget. And that is you should answer the question that you're asked. It sounds silly. When we were asked, what is the state of knowledge about medical assistance in dying? The answer is, this is the state of knowledge about medical say, assistance in dying. You should do this dying. or that. Yeah. If they had asked us, what do you think we should do about Bill C-14, we would have answered that question. So question forming and answering in policy is essential. It is an art, it is a science, it is a technique, it is something that you, you learn. The other thing that goes in this list of virtues, again for my colleagues in the, in the academy, um, that really relates to, I think, our sense of identity um, and importance or even our insecurity. And I say our because, you know, once an academic, always an academic, we have it in our DNA. Um, that insecurity, by the way, is located on the long arm of chromosome 12. It's a <laughs> very expressive gene and highly penetrant in folks who work in, in uh, the advice business. I think we sometimes think that by natural inclination, when someone asks us a question, we demonstrate our expertise by not only saying, this is the answer to your question, but we get to show off our answer by saying, this is what I think you should do about it. That's how I show you how wise I am. It's quite hard to stop talking after you've answered the question that you're asked. <laughs> Especially, I say this about others, not about me. Mark knows, <laughs> Mark knows me, Teresa knows me. There's a lot of people in the room who know that's fascinating you're saying this, Neslin. Um, but I do think this is knowing your audience. Um, I'm, I'm gratified to hear Sally's description of being on the inside. Because when I came to CCA and I was told, we don't give recommendations. We just give what the state, this is the state of knowledge. I thought, well, that's kind of silly. What, what's so hard about saying, and I think you should do this? You could say, no, I'm not going to do it. Thank you for your, like, wh why is that such an impenetrable wall between? And what I learned was there are lots of people who can give advice. Lots. In fact, many are paid to do it. There are very few, and I'm speaking only about my current post, there are very few that exist in the world of policy, health policy, science policy, who can tell you the objective information, that the answer to your question, with the least amount of advocacy, lobbying, marketing. Now, don't get me wrong, you can write a report that is full of recommendations, that doesn't have the word recommendation or advice in it. You can, this is the art and science of policy where you can make clear what ought to happen. When I mentioned the Treasury Board Secretariat's climate uh, change assessment, they already knew that the evidence on climate change was solid. They weren't asking, do we need to know anything more about it? It's given that it's, this is the case. Given that this is the case, what are our options with respect to policy? So I think it it's, it's depends. And of course, one of the problems that scientists do with politicians is they want to advise and tell them what to do. They very rarely do, and I learned to do this, listen mm. and then say, I think you're trying to achieve this. Is that right? Because once you hear what they want to achieve, you can begin to help them. Mm -hmm 
through conversation, think about how they might make it happen. But most scientists come in and they don't know how to stop and they're not good at listening. So we should perhaps, with my final sort of comment, start getting the audience involved. And um, the question I want to ask you to reflect on is this. We've talked about advice and stuff. But making things happen, so both for AMR and for climate change, we know the problem, and we've got the technology to do something about it. But we don't. Why don't we? What are the barriers? And to involve the question, we have, um, Teresa, if I may, for you to reflect yourself, because I'm going to ask you, with your distinguished career in uh, health psychology, to say, what are these barriers that actually stop people from doing what they actually know they have to do. Why don't they do it? Governments, corporations, individual citizens. Would you like to sort of? I, I will offer a, a quote from uh, John F. Kennedy's uh, famous uh, Rice <laughs> University speech about going to the moon. Everyone probably remembers this speech uh, where he uh, suggests that um, we can go to the moon by the end of the decade and, and return a man, that's our goal. And most people can, if they are nerds like me, can quote the, most of the speech, uh, but they tend to focus on, um, this is what we're going to do, and we do these things not because they're easy, but because they're hard, and it's, you sort of use these, this speech in an undergraduate public policy class to sort of talk about an inspiring, um, speech to galvanize around a big topic, going to the moon, mapping and sequencing the genome. I mean, Watson's uh, testimony before the US Congress was really quite uh, simplistic and charming. It's give me $3 billion in 10 years, and I will map and sequence the human genome. And he gave a tutorial to members of Congress, of, like, what's a genome? And by the end, they wrote the check. Now, he did one thing that was interesting. He said, we'll also look at the ethical, legal, and social issues, which sort of tamped down their, their concern. But the Kennedy lecture, the Kennedy statement, which is often forgotten, is that he said, we have all the technology in the world. We're the smartest country. We can galvanize the engineers and others. What we lack is leadership. We lack, and by that he didn't mean we don't have a president. He meant we don't have the galvanizing public interest to take us forward, which is, if that's a segue to Dr. Marteau, I don't know, but it's, it's not simply the technical means. You can appropriate millions of dollars or millions of pounds. That's not a hard technique, but what it's requiring is overcoming many of the the behavioral and social and political barriers that people have, for which we don't have one uh, true strategy for implementing. So the only thing I would add, uh, because I think <coughs> Teresa will be much better than me, is you always have to look at the incentive structure, uh, whether it's a doctor, a nurse, a member of the public, or a pharmaceutical company. And if you can really tease out and understand the incentives for different behaviors, you can begin to get into it. But if you ignore the incentive structure, you will not make yeah. progress. No Teresa, pressure. do you have any observations? <laughs> With that um, introduction. Well, first, first of all, I want to thank uh, all of you, actually, for a really, really stimulating a uh, conversation uh, on which I want to make hundreds of interventions. So I'm going to row back um, and I'm going to make an observation and suggest somebody else's framework for policy inertia um, and on the big challenges we face, and I'm going to just take climate change and obesity. So what, I, what I'd be keen for Sally to reflect on if she wants to come back to this first of all is um, your last report uh, was Time to Solve Childhood Obesity. Hard-hitting report where 
you didn't use economic arguments so much as human rights, really, and talked about the right of a child to live in a healthy environment. And I thought that was very powerful, and I'd be keen to have some discussion. There's probably some lawyers here about the extent to which we might be relying more on legal argument than evidence for the future in order to get some shift. Um, the other thing that you noted in that report, Sally, was how um, government had an ambition to halve childhood obesity by 2030. And you said, and we're nowhere near achieving that. And for those of you who are unfamiliar with um, policy making in the UK, I can't recommend more highly my favorite TV channel called parliament.tv. <laughs> and if you look up, um, I think it was the last session of evidence um, from the House of Commons Health and Social Care uh, Committee chaired by the then uh, Member of Parliament, Dr. Sarah Wollaston, where she called Sally, other um, uh, civil servants and uh, politicians and academics to account for the lack of progress we've made in childhood obesity. And it's gripping TV. So um, I, won't, I won't spoil it, but it's a bit of a car crash. Uh, not, not, not Sally's part in it. Um, so uh, that, that, those are the comments I want to make. And just come back to the key question, I think, that you frame, Ron, which is how do we understand what has been called pol policy inertia? So this is described in uh, Boyd Swinburne's article on global syndemics. The global syndemics, it's a Lancet commission, global syndemics of obesity, undernutrition, and climate change. And put very simply, there are three uh, sets of factors to try to understand why, despite having a lot of evidence that could make a major difference in those areas, we don't make progress. One is leadership, as Eric's already said, uh, at, you think it's bad here, but it's not just here uh, in this country, uh, sort of globally. Second point are the powerful commercial interests, um, thinking about the merchants of doubt. Uh, so this has been described for the last decade. Um, and so I think that's where the legal perspective starts to come in. Is that where we're going to start seeing, as your yeah. mother would say, where evidence is going to be played out yeah. uh, in the courts to counter those? And the third is a lack of public demand for policies. And I think there's a very interesting experiment that's going on at the moment in the UK, which is the climate change um, citizens' assembly that's just been set up. Uh, one's just been set up in France as well. We have one in Ireland. So I think it's a very interesting space where we will begin to see or hear more of a public voice of whether that manages to shift the policy inertia. So I'd be really keen to hear any yeah. reflections. So, so reflections. Can, yes. Uh, I, when I did that obesity report, I, I knew it would come out as I was leaving, and I was very keen to leave what I thought was a foundational report that was rather hard-hitting that others could use later on. She said it. It's there. But actually, in asking around, um, I ended up talking to the Frameworks Institute. And I, I have often argued that one of my successes in government is being able to see things from other people's perspective and frame what I'm saying so that it means something to them. And what they said to me about obesity, and they did a whole piece of work, which you probably have seen, actually, but others may not, is that actually, first of all, our norms have changed so people don't see the obesity. So you've got to be careful that you're not about that. But the second is, because of the way it has been discussed as an epidemic ever, and so complex, everyone feels, oh, dear, I can't do anything about that. So you have to start to change the framing so people feel it can be attacked, it can be solved and something done. And they have worked very hard on this and they reckon that the way to frame childhood obesity was that the unhealthy food was in the spotlight. The child was in this um, absolute um, tsunami of unhealthy food and drink. And 
to take away it's that anyone's fault, but that this is how it is, and you can attack these things and do something about it. And, I, and the human rights bit came out, not from them, but from, so how do we reframe it? Hang on a minute, and it was a Cambridge lawyer who did that piece of work <coughs> with us to help. And I, I think in the end it'll catch, but just at the moment the government haven't got time for that, but they'll come back to it. They'll have to. I guess the only thing I would add, it's a great, it's a great story, um, and picking up on your point about, about frameworks, which um, is also a, a normal sort of academic strategy to kind of <coughs> rewind the tape and say, no, actually the problem is this, no, actually the problem, you sort of try and get far enough back so that you can then start going forward together with a common um, uh, approach. And I don't know that I'm <laughs> cynical. Maybe I've just become a bit more pragmatic. Um, I, too, like the human rights argument. I happen to be inclined towards it. Maybe it's you know, the way that I was raised. It, it resonates with me. But I also realize that it doesn't resonate with everyone. So I'm becoming more of a fan of the all of the above strategy. Whatever framework actually works to get you to the table is probably best. So the Don't. reason I used human rights on this one yeah. was because we had a lot of, I don't know that it's public, polling data mm -hmm. that the public think government should act to protect their children. So how do you say to the government, you, you show them the polling data and we exposed a bit of it, but you've got a very good reason. The public want it right. and here's your reason to do it. So I chose it specifically because of the polling. And I think it's a perfect example of the, of the pragmatic proposition. That was, remember before I was talking about what's the right way at the right time. I think that's exactly the right approach. It might not have worked five years ago. It might not have worked 10 years ago, and it may not work um, in, the, in the future. Uh, the other thing that sort of occurs to me about, about the, um, some of the topics, they may lend themselves more to one framework than another. I mean, the, one could make, and I have seen the climate change topic also framed as a human rights argument. And it actually doesn't work that well because the topic is seen as almost too large. Whereas obesity or the opioid epidemic, something we haven't talked about, which is a, perhaps even as equivalent to AMR in some, I don't know what, what is equivalent to which, even choosing which is a similar case to another one is kind of a, a fascinating exercise. But deciding what is the right framework for the right problem. I happen to think that it was a good idea for the reasons I mentioned. One is I, I sort of am intuitively attracted to human rights approaches as a way to think about public policy. And it may have worked even better for this case for reasons that, includes, um, that include good evidence. And yet, I, I keep coming back to, or I think we always keep coming back to, well, if, we, if that seems to work, why is it not always working? What is it um, that is preventing what seems to be um, in everyone's best interest? You know, the idea that the, that the <coughs> climate is uh, warming. The evidence has been clear for quite some time. And even if you are the most uh, fundamentalist petrochemical um, zealot, who wants to get the last uh, ounce of coal out of the ground for reasons related to self-interest or aggrandizement <laughs> or, or commerce, I still don't understand why people can't see it's in the best interest of everyone, even if you're wrong, just to clean up the planet, just to leave it cleaner, leave the water cleaner for the next generation. Like I, when I say I don't understand, I think I do, but I, I'm frustrated by the fact that even good arguments that aren't even evidence thick, they're almost <coughs> straightforward, um, aren't convincing. And that's where some of these, you started with, Teresa, I don't want to put her on the spot again, but you're, you're really referring to some of the, the bread and the bone uh, sort of behavioral um, heuristics that people either use or they don't even understand that they are there that are impeding uh, our capacity to have sort of common sense approaches. And this isn't to take a position on any approach. I think it's goofy to have lots of guns. I just think it's, it's a silly idea. It's also dangerous. 
It's also a lot of things. I don't know why we have to have a lot of guns. That's just Eric Meslin's view. Well, I lived for 15 years in the state of Indiana, um, a state that doesn't think that's goofy. It's completely normal. It's in fact, they could make a human rights argument. They happen to make a Second Amendment rights. It's not the same thing. But so I'm, I realize that there are sort of policy bubbles that can't be simply smoothed over and we all ought to think the same way. And perhaps that's why it's so difficult. I don't know if I'd go as far, Ron, as to say they're wicked problems. I, I have a view about some of them are more wicked than others, but the ones we've been talking about actually aren't. I do think that they, uh, they have solutions. They have multiple solutions, and we just have to choose that we want to address them. So before I go to Herbert, Theresa, do you want to have a final say on this, or are you, are you happy? Right. I, I, partly, I was interested, I just, just wanted yeah. to clarify um, that I think a lot of this is going to be settled in court, and, and Sally knows that uh, some of the things she worked on and I contributed to a little bit with David Spiegelhalter um, in terms of standardised packaging of tobacco. You know, that, that, the battle was in the courts, and I do think that increasingly that's where the battles are going to be mm -hmm. had. They sued me. And we need to, uh, we need to have evidence that's fit yeah. for a, a, a court. Yep. Whether we like it or not. I think that's yeah. fit. Okay. Yeah. I agree. Well, could I just start by saying, in contrast to almost everybody in this audience, I know no medicine. I would faint at the sight of blood. But I do know a lot about climate change. I've written about 50 papers, and I've talked a lot on it. And they've been talked together by everybody here. But the point I'd like to make, they're totally and utterly different. In medicine, the overall aim is to have people live healthier and longer lives. Climate change, especially coming from a Canadian, is enormously advantage advantageous for some countries. Canada is going to have much better crops because of climate change. Um, Russia is going to do much better. If Australia stopped uh, selling the, uh, or digging up the coal and selling it, it would be a financial disaster. Now that's quite different to uh, medicine. Nobody said, well it would be better off if you died, excuse me, not personally, uh, it would be better off if you died. It's totally and utterly different. And the way you handled it uh, handle it is also uh, different and that's partly why there's the different attitudes. Nobody's going to say there's, get, there's an advantage to this uh, terrible virus, the Wuhan uh, flu. There's incredible advantage to uh, having the earth get warmer, especially in this country. <laughs> <laughs> Any? Paul got one and then Stephen down there after Paul. Yeah. I've got so many questions, I don't, don't know which one to ask, but one of the sort of interesting things about the things that people have raised today, climate change, obesity, antimicrobial resistance, to which I might add as an example, the aging population and the need for care, health care for burdens of old age, is that a lot of these things were seen as problems many years ago. You know, it's a long time since I was a medical student, but we were talking about antimicrobial resistance then. People were talking about climate change over 100 years ago. And yet it seems that you almost have to get to the crisis before anybody really starts to take any real notice. So I wondered, perhaps this is an unfair question, whether you have any insights as to how we can actually kind of start to make things change earlier. Because actually it would probably be cheaper. If we'd started to work on antimicrobial resistance when I was a medical student, seriously, the cost would be way less than it is now to deal with it. And you could probably say the same about climate change. So I'm not sure if that makes sense as a question, but... I think it's a very fair comment, actually. How do you, uh, how do you make people take notice of something that's impending when human nature discounts things and gets on with pleasure and, and the moment? And I think that's... not impending, it's what is going to happen. Yeah, yeah, all right, well, impending a long time out. And I do think that is part of the role of science, to lay the basis so that as it gets closer and people start to begin to listen, 
that we've got the science there. I mean, we do have various horizon scanning opportunities and, and ways of doing things. It was a very good David King actually um, s um, held it, as it were, um, horizon scanning report on obesity, well before many people were clocking it, but the scientists put it all together and raised it up. So I think science has a role in working on these things to raise them up and to be there with actually some of the answers when it becomes salient. But it's the difficulty of getting salience when it's not immediate. Do you think immediate. they do a better job of saying, look, we were right, and actually pointing out stuff? That no, they don't easy. like it if you're right. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we don't, as, uh, you know, if when a husband says, I was right all along. <laughs> I mean, I, but I think in terms of climate change, um, people writing about transition risks have pointed this out economically, that uh, the cost is going to be much greater if we do things 10 years down than if we do start now. St Stephen Thornton. Yeah, I just wonder if we've got a new phenomenon at play now that we didn't have in the recent past, and that's the extraordinary power of social media to influence whole populations. And it seems, maybe it's just my rather jaundiced view, that that tends to be used quite successfully that pe by people who actually uh, want to put about falsehoods rather than those of you that want to put about a version of the truth. And, and I'm just wondering how those of you that are in positions of wanting to influence on the basis of evidence <coughs> can and should use social media. Hmm. I'll, I'll, I'll make a yeah. I'll make a, a, another little drop of the of the pebble and maybe combine the the uh, an answer with the question that came up before about uh, emergencies and and the like. Um, I don't think there's any doubt that um, we're sort of in an information tsunami just generally, and I don't think we I don't think we fully understand what that what that means to be perfectly honest. I, I think it would be um, naive to suggest that the problem is there are a lot of platforms and a lot of people are using a lot of platforms, some for mischief, some for play. Um, I mean, I know, again, we're going back to our friend Teresa, but I know we know that there are a lot of people who simply play around with genomic information for entertainment, whereas others play around with it for very serious medical conversations. And you can't really tell the difference if you're looking at someone's Facebook page as to what purpose they are attaching. So um, I think we're only getting to the point where we're naming the problem and understanding it, let alone trying to sort of unpack it. That's not a, a good answer. I can tell you when I arrived at, at CCA four years ago, my staff were um, pleasantly surprised that I actually had a Twitter handle because my predecessor did not. And that, that was neither good nor bad. It was, well, now we can use your name to help promote our projects. Feel free, promote. I tweeted about my pleasure at being on the conversation this evening. So I, I don't know that we know what the name of the problem is that you're raising. It, I think it would be too simple to say it can be used for ill, and somehow we should, what, fill in the blank, censor, uh, filter, uh, remove. But I want to get back to a version of that with the, with the answer, an answer to the question to the, uh, uh, to the comment earlier. And that is, I think we're also in an environment where everything becomes important. So the, the social media instrument happens to um, horizontalize every emergency. The Iowa caucus is now an emergency. Is it more or less important than AMR? Well, at the, this moment right now, it might be more important, like for the next eight hours before the United States blows up. Um, <laughs> but AMR is still there chugging along. It's been chugging along. And um, I'm probably the least qualified because I've never held an elected uh, position to know what it's like when there are several high priority topics that are incommensurable in their importance. AMR, what's happening in uh, the Middle East, uh, what's happening in, uh, in, uh, in China, in Wuhan with the coronavirus. These are not just challenges. 
you realize that we also know that the majority of the elected legislators in the G20 are not people of letters. They are not people who are scientifically um, um, sophisticated. Now, that doesn't mean that if you had a legislature that was all scientists, it would be better. There's evidence that suggests that it wouldn't be. It might be a lot worse. Uh, so I think some of this is about how priorities get set. And the default becomes, well, now it's a real emergency. And now we have to do something because you know, we're running out of whatever time that happens to mean. I'm not happy with that answer because I realize that this is what has, this is the phenomenon of democratic deliberation uh, around the world. I, I mentioned to Ron that one of the things that impressed me most about the coronavirus response um, was not that WHO declared a public health emergency of international concern in the time that they did. Good on you, I'm glad they did. But that they built two hospitals with 2,600 beds in eight days. <laughs> I found that absolutely stunning and fascinating. I don't think that would happen in Canada, <laughs> and I don't think it would happen in the United States. I, two countries I know well, I would not presume to make, draw a conclusion about whether that would happen here. <laughs> but it happened there. How is it that that leadership, policy decision, priority was made, and now there are 2,600 beds awaiting, unfortunately, what will be a uh, you know, an onslaught of patients. So by way of involving more of the audience, Mary Dixon Woods, you've been battling away at quality in healthcare. So how do you see the barriers? And then I'm going to ask, if I may, Heidi Allen, you've been battling away as an MP. So we've got an MP, an oh, academic, <laughs> at your particular interest in social care and stuff. So what do you, to, what do you first, Mary, what do you see as the barriers that prevent you from getting these things done? kinds of things you've been describing today. Some of the, the challenges in trying to improve quality are we have poor measurement, uh, so it's actually very hard to uh, identify and monitor many of the problems. And then many of the interventions uh, lack uh, evidence. In fact, uh, infection control is a major area of concern because there are only a small number of interventions that are very well evidence-based. Um, and some of the infection control has done itself a lot of a lot of damage by promoting uh, interventions that lack an evidence base. An example of something that's linked to the pl the climate uh, change emergency was five years ago in the states uh, there were recommendations for disposable gowns and disposable bouffant hats, as they're called, to be used. Um, it has since turned out that neither of these interventions uh, has any impact on infection control, but they add enormously to plastic waste and uh, have other um, uh, unfortunate implications. So promoting interventions with that before the evidence is there, and to Teresa's point, using um, behavioral and social interventions and incentives that actually produce unwanted consequences is, is some of what's gone wrong in, in the quality area. So how about from the perspective as a jobbing MP, where do you see the, um, the, 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 the barriers? A recovering MP, <laughs> yes. who is as depressed and amused by listening to this tonight in equal measure, I have to tell you. Um, it is hard because as MPs you are bombarded left, right and centre, not just nationally what's on the agenda, but locally as well. Every constituency, of course, has different issues. Um, and it is a, a depressing fact that unless we have proportional representation, or let's all hope a socking great majority that allows a government to have focus and purpose, and let's all be cheerful and hopeful about that, um, it, <laughs> it, is, it isn't gonna be easy because there will be competing priorities. I suppose the observation I would make about how you get your voice heard, um, the thing I learned was accepting that it might not be your voice actually on this occasion, and it can be timing, but it can also be, it's just not my voice, and it can be social media, it can be a celebrity. I mean, David Attenborough has done more for awareness on, on plastics in our oceans, I think, than any other person on the planet. It can be um, the combination of voices I found when I campaigned, totally different topic now, but on, on refugees, for example, um, or on welfare. It was lots of organizations working together, not individuals trying to succeed and say, I know more than you, I've got more evidence than you. You have to combine so that there is only one voice that the policymaker hears but accept that every time it is going to be different and one, one method doesn't suit all occasions. 
So we've only got um, another six minutes, and I'm just wondering whether, oh, there's another, um, one more question, and then I want to finish off. Yes, Nita. Hi, Nita Furi from the School of Clinical Medicine. Fascinating, really thought-provoking. So one of the thoughts I have is, um, we've heard about all the qualities that are needed. We need leadership, we need evidence when it's available, plus the judgment. What if the judgment is wrong in retrospect, or what are your insights when a policy goes through, if there's pushback or there's uh, you know, nanny state or names are being called, uh, do you have any insights on how to deal with that and what do you not do? I think I was known as the nation's chief nanny. <laughs> and indeed, I, I did on occasion say to the, um, the ministers that you know, I accepted that role and if they wanted to give it to me, if it got the thing to move forward, that would be fine by me. Um, it, you know, you make a judgment. You don't probably always get it right. But the thing is, to, it's like clinical medicine. You make a diagnosis, you try a treatment, and if actually it doesn't work, because we haven't got personalized medicine properly yet to know that it should work, then you, you think again. It's normal life. So, can we finish with some comments from you about risk? What sort of degree of risk should policymakers take? So, I would like you to reflect on this in the context of coronavirus and the precautionary principle. Where do you both stand? You can stand. <laughs> so, uh, easy topic. Actually, I'm thinking about the MPs. Um, I thought insightful point about uh, not being about you, that takes an awful lot of courage in an era of expertise um, to be able to step aside and either say, I don't know, it takes a lot of courage to say, no, I really, I don't know the answer, ask someone else. Um, you don't lose anything by saying you don't know. You probably have a, two of those opportunities in an advisory role, and if you say it the third time and they say, well, we'd like to find somebody who knows something. Um, but uh, you know Ron's frame around around uh, coronavirus and risk. I think, as uh, as Joanne Lai once said when asked about democracy, um, you know what do you think of it? And the answer was so too soon to tell. I think it's too soon to tell whether what we're doing now is um, a result of the appropriate amount of of risk assessment applied deliberately. Um, or whether it's as much about some of the other things we've been talking about. There's a, a new WHO director general who's in charge than there was during you know, H5N1. There's a, there are a new set of conditions uh, around. And I don't know that the world response, such as it is, and by, when I say world response, I include things like countries deciding to close their airspace or deciding to send planes to return their nationals. There are a bunch of responses. The hospital build was just an obvious one because you could see it in time elapsed photography on social media, um, something that you would never have seen uh, even a few years ago. So my, if, I'm not judging what's happened yet. I don't think that was the, uh, the question. But I do think we tend to forget what we have learned um, a little too often. In the case of coronavirus, I don't think we are forgetting what we learned from uh, SARS, something that affected Canada uh, quite a bit, um, or from uh, two of the uh, pandemic influenza experiences that we had, and now coronavirus. And the question is not, have we learned, but what is it that we have learned with respect to risk and Ron's uh, suggested how we think about the precautionary principle. I don't know that we're in, it is being applied or invoked in any deliberate uh, way, uh, except to say we haven't waited for all the evidence to come in before acting. And in some extreme versions of the precautionary principle, um, you want to be absolutely sure something is safe before you do something else. You don't have the luxury in public health emergencies to wait um, for infinity uh, to see if, if the, the data are, are clear. What I like personally about what I have seen is there is an effort in particular on the part of the, the Chinese government to be 
more uh, transparent, quote, than they were before. Now, I realize that's a, a highly qualifying phrase, but in, a, in an environment where the current rate of infection seems to be greater than what we saw 10 years ago, any amount of transparency, including sharing of samples and uh, relaxing of policy so that science can move, is a, is a good thing and is an implicit statement of, of, uh, of risk. Last word. So if we start with China, they look to be doing all the right things, possibly, well, likely, two to three weeks later than we would yes. ideally like. Why are the numbers that they tell us about, transparently, not where the modelers are? Mm -hmm. Well, probably there are a heck of a lot of people who are infected that they actually have not tested and don't know, and so they're just not collecting those numbers. So the people who say, well, they're not being transparent because they're not telling us about the numbers. Look what the modeling shows. It must be higher. Well, yes, it must be higher, but they, for all they're feeling it, they're not counting it, and they can't. In the midst of what's going on, they can't. It's not doable. So well done, China, to date um, on what we can see um, and everything. But risk, and where are you? So take this country. We learnt through the 910 uh, flu where we were. We had a very good lessons learnt, and we, and we developed a pandemic flu plan. Um, which uh, had a lot of input from academics and public health people, infectious disease people across the country. Um, and I, I came in as interim CMO in 2010 as we were really working hard on that. And I think it was quite a good plan. But what we did was about um, two, three years ago, we exercised for three days across the whole of government a simulation using that plan, and we realized there were things that we had not uh, had in that plan. Um, I have to say that after a few years having coped with Ebola in West Africa and Novichok and various things, I understood more, so as CMO I understood more. Uh, we had a wonderful chief scientific advisor who's now the CMO, who's an infectious disease doctor as part of it. And we set to, supported by the um, Cabinet Secretary uh, and the Cabinet Office, to build all sorts of other bits of plan that are there. And I think that work was quite stressful. People didn't want to do it. It was very difficult. It went right out into local authorities. It went into how will the NHS work? How will we deploy nurses? What will we stop doing? When do we stop using ITUs? population triage, it brought in ethicists and people. And I think we have a very good plan. And coronavirus is, as a respiratory virus, um, we, we are using that plan. So what are the risks? Well, if we activate everything too early, we're spending money and diverting people from doing the daily job. If we don't activate it on time, we will get more infections and more deaths than we should have and will be castigated. And so you just do have to take judgments and build it quite carefully. And alongside that, there's a political risk. And the political risk is that they don't appear to take it seriously enough and act to protect the public. No government will last if they're not seen to put the public first. I look at Heidi to see if she agrees. You have to You hold expect that, wouldn't you? Yeah. I mean, we all expect our government to look after us. <coughs> and if they can't, civil disorder. And actually, we even have a plan for that. <laughs> um, <laughs> so you're, what you're trying to put side by side is <coughs> a pretty good plan, I think it needed some improvement, it's happening. Um, but when it does the risk, the real risk of the disease hitting us and going up, hit, so how do you move it smoothly into action against the political risk? Um, and politically, they felt, and I, I absolutely get it, they had to fly nationals out of Wuhan. You have 
have to balance that with, can they fly the rest of them out of China? Ooh. They felt they had to quarantine them in Arrow Park rather than let them self-quarantine. Um, those are not public health judgments in general. Those are political risk. Um, you have to think about the risk to the public's health, the political risk, and you balance them all. I am someone who believes in vaccination, in buying my insurance, in being careful and prepared. Um, so I think we are right to take every precaution and start what others might think too early. I would prefer us, and the ministers are there, of every ilk. Spend more money that, in the hope that it doesn't come our way than don't spend it and don't do it. Um, and I always used to get really fed up with officials who'd say, oh, you know, in Novichok or Ebola or whatever, oh, we can't do that. The treasurer will never give us the money. And I'd say, rubbish. If we need it for a reason like this, of course they'll give us the money. Just shut up and do it and I'll sort the treasury. <laughs> you know. Okay, well, on that note, we, we've had a wonderful conversation. Thank you both very much for coming and thank you, those members of the audience who've commented as, as well. So, off to drinks. <laughs>